Well, we can write code that we don't understand, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> what are you saying? Uh, who are you? Hi, I'm Carl Stiefvater. I'm using artificial intelligence to generate computer graphics. And that's what the people who created the atom bomb or said, w I'm just uh, doing this little thing here, and then... Hi, I'm Carl. I'm splitting the atom, and you are listening to the Drax Files Radio Hour. <laughs> Carl, you're making yourself obsolete with artificial intelligence. That's what you're really doing. Hi, I'm Carl Stiefvater. I'm creating our dystopia, and you are listening to the Drax Files Radio Hour with Joe Yardley. Welcome to the Drax Files Radio Hour with Joe Yardley. My name is Draxter Dupre. Joe Yardley is again not here today because we have to do a, a short program. Um, I'm about to, uh, well, as you're listening to this, I'm probably on a plane, uh, on a physical plane. So today we have a very special guest. But before I introduce the guest, I wanted to let you guys know that um, the two students from UCLA who are doing uh, amazing research in the psychology department using OpenSim, that show is in the can. It has to be edited, and that will be uh, out in a couple of weeks. And also uh, Jessica Lyon from Firestorm will be on the program uh, a week from now talking about the new Gateway program. Uh, Bright Canopy guys will be on talking about SL streaming. And so we, we have not forgotten about SL News. But today, a 180 or a 179, because uh, with me on the program is Carl Stiefvater, uh, formerly known as just Carl with Q. And Carl is not, uh, used to be with Linden Lab as, um, uh, I don't know. Uh, hi, Carl, uh, by the way. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. A blast from the past, huh? You are in the past for, from our perspective, but you're in the future. You're in the future from your perspective. Right, right, right. Well, it's all relative, right? I think somebody was somebody had that theory. So you have been putting something together that is pretty amazing. It's a mobile app, and SL listeners, I don't turn off the the radio or whatever you're listening this on just yet because this is really cool um <laughs> it's not it's not really in the vein of virtual worlds although it will help you guys build much more interesting virtual worlds down the line um it's more artificial intelligence it's a marriage of artificial intelligence and graphics and until very recently, we haven't had the computational power to do this kind of stuff. We've got to tell people a quick example. So I'm taking a photo, <clears throat> and then you want to blow the punchline. But see, this is like the least interesting aspect of it. So there's an app, right? Drax wants me to tell you about the app. And the app is cool, but the app doesn't capture the entire coolness of the project. Let me tell you what the app does. It's like an Instagram filter, right? So you've seen a filter where you take a picture and it'll turn it into a watercolor, right? Mm -hmm. or, look, or like a look from the 70s or whatever. Except it lets you create any filter you want by showing it a picture of what you want it to look like. So if you want your picture to look like a pizza, you show it a pizza and suddenly your picture is rendered as pizza. Or if you want to sh show it a picture of some artistic masterpiece you show it the artistic masterpiece and suddenly you're rendered as if picasso had painted you i need to jump in here because when uh, we need to say that this is not a filter that is just overlaying in on it it really the the under and i'm gonna shut up and let you really kind of go into detail here but the but the underlying um artificially intelligent painter is analyzing that style and then uh, applies that style to the to the photo. So if your daughter or my son would, uh, if I would feed the machine <clears throat> a drawing of our kids, let's say, th that st the, the the machine would be able to analyze that style, right? And then would would apply this to to the sort of material I give him. That's something fun my daughter does now. Is she will take a pink she so she drew this picture and she fed it in and now she takes pictures of people and it renders them as if she had drawn them. From my perspective, you know, having a background in graphics, it's it's black magic. It really is you know, I a lot of people hear about it and they're like, yeah, yeah, it's another Photoshop filter. I'm like, no, this is 
This is a slice of the future. We shouldn't, yeah, in 2015, we shouldn't be able to tell computers, make this picture look like that picture. That's not a reasonable request. And yet we can. And it bends my mind. It is the machine goes to uh, art school, basically, for eight, for four, eight years, but within three minutes. If you want it. If you want to get technical, I can I can get technical. But yes, the, the general gist is is that it compresses an art history degree into like 15 seconds. I'm going to throw out one more example, then let you talk. I took my uh, Gretsch um, jazz guitar and took um, and fed the machine uh, a photo from uh, Maurice Sendek, uh, where the wild things are, and 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 uh, the the Gretsch guitar looked. Um, as if it were uh, just straight out of that book. Um, you guys have a public group now uh, on Facebook, and people are posting stuff there, and it's it's it is really unbelievable. Yeah, it's um, uh, it's so so. I was able to. I've been playing with this for a few months. Uh, it's 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 like a new breakthrough. It only came out a couple of months ago. Um, And I had a blast with it, and I was posting all this stuff to Facebook, and my friends were like, we want to play with this too. So that's where the app comes from, is I'm trying to make it so that everybody can play with this, because it is a ton of fun. It lets you, it lets people who have artistic ideas, but not artistic skill sets, to produce interesting images. Like, um, like, of course, so, you know, it's pretty easy to create a painting now, you know, if you want a painting and it's pretty easy to like duplicate someone's artistic style. If you want it to be a Picasso painting or a Van Gogh painting or you know, whatever you want. Uh, but also like one of my favorite examples, we've, we've been doing this for about two and a half weeks now. So <laughs> it's kind of, it's, it's definitely blowing up. We've done, we've, we've burned through over a million CPU minutes so far in two weeks uh, producing all this imagery. Uh, my friend, who, getting back to politics, is sort of interested in politics, uh, rendered uh, George W. Bush in the style of the World Trade Center exploding. So his, his face is made up of the skyscrapers and his eyes are the fireballs. And It's a really powerful image. And, you know, wherever you stand on the political spectrum, it's a powerful image. And it's not something he could have done four weeks ago. No, and George W. Bush couldn't have done that because I was just going to say, as you know, uh, W. also uh, paints. Um, he paints dogs. We could, we could feed in some of his paintings and see how he would how he would paint the World Trade Centers blowing up. That would be a very, you should, you should get your iPhone back and, and do that experiment. That would be, that's a good one. I'm just looking at the Facebook page real quick because there is one that came in and it's a uh, Carla Saunders, may, maybe a, fr a friend of yours. She is a painter and she took a photo of her studio desk with, with brushes and everything and paints and then rendered that in the style of her painting as if she is, painting her own studio yeah no is there's just lots of cool stuff and so uh you know if if you want to tie this into second life i'm taking my experiences with the second life community and and applying them here we're we're growing a little community of people who are creating beautiful things and helping each other build beautiful things not everything has to be tied back in not everything has to be tied back into second life who cares I understand your, your viewership. And I have to be honest, you know, I learned a lot while I lived in Second Life. In fact, one of my first experiments before you could do these images, uh, before we had the computational power, uh, 10 years ago, I made my, do you remember my maze, my cave maze that I had that was my office? That was generated using a very similar technique. That's right. Artificial intelligence to search for, then it was a maze, or then it was, you know, an arrangement of uh, voxels like Minecraft, um, and predated Minecraft, by the way. Uh, but, but it was artificial intelligence, but that was the best you could do. Now you can do high-res images, and, and it's cool looking. It's it's cool, and it's, it's, on, it's I can't say it enough. It's my blow. I need to, I need to say, too, it's just the start, right? It's... There's a lot of cool stuff coming out. So anyway, 
the cultural pessimist one in me wants to ask of course another question which is um uh, great now you know like you said earlier now every every idiot can feel like there's a painter like a lot of my musician friends go like oh my god look at this they have the samples that they have and the arpeggiator now and the and the orchestra is sampled uh and it's the end of all, it's the end of all uh, sort of engaging, tactile uh, relationship with uh, with artistic endeavor. What, what would you say to that? Yeah, no, sure. Uh, and there are a lot of artists uh, who are upset by this. Um, I think, uh, I think if your skill set relies on something... Uh, technical that you had to practice a lot you, you might be a little bit afraid uh, but I think I think all of humanity should be afraid because the machines you know they can drive for us they can paint for us they can sing for us we're all going to be out of work now we're going to the meta level I think that's great actually I see a lot of opportunity in 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 I don't know, a coexistence with the machines, I guess. But what people with those skill sets have been able to do for their entire lives is they've been able to uh, express themselves. They, they've been able to create maybe uh, a language, their own language, like through, through music or through their paintings, that they'll still be able to explore, they'll still be able to use with technology, but it'll just be easier. You know, uh, you, won't, you won't have to... Uh, you won't have to to play a cello if you don't want to. Uh, you can virtually play a cello. Yeah, but maybe then it will become uh, a subset of of or or a new interest may emerge uh, where these things may coexist, so that it becomes something special that we go to a concert again, maybe or. I don't know. I mean, I'm concerned about all these things, but at the same time, I do think that uh, it's almost, I mean, I don't know if that comparison is valid, uh, that vinyl is, you know, vinyl has come back so hard. There's so many v vinyl things. There's like a vinyl subscription service and stuff. There is the element of authenticity. You know, it's not, the painter doesn't use actual paints, and there is something about the smell of the paint and the way it smears that, that you could never capture. So I don't, I don't think that stuff will go away entirely. For commercials, say to Toyota wants a painting, right? They're not going to care about the actual paint, the smell of the paint. They're just going to want their commercial. And so uh, some number of artists who make Toyota commercials right now will be put out of work. And honestly, they should be making real art and not Toyota commercials. We're going to get both a lot of hate mail because that's what I always tell my son as well. You know, maybe a generation ago, people would have sort of advised you with an artistic talent. You know what? You got to go to this ad agency and then you can make tons of bucks and, and you can also kind of express yourself. Yeah, it's maybe not 100% what you want to do, but you can make tons of bucks. And uh, and that's going to really change. And I th and that is actually maybe a good thing so that we use that time. I mean, we got to figure out how we earn an income, obviously. Um, I'm personally, a oh God, Carl always drags me into these political discussions I have to mention the guaranteed uh, basic income that Finland just uh, has. I think that's a that's a very valid uh, proposal, actually. Well, I mean, the question is, uh, quite literally, the machines are going to put us out of work. There's nothing they can't do. So either we're all going to sit on the side of the road starving or something else is going to happen. And I don't know what else that is going to be. Well, we can read and write, and, and the machines can give us their money or not. <laughs> and I, I think I know which way that's going to go because I think in the end, there are more of us than there are the machines. So, do, do you then see a world where we can really pursue that? The best possible scenario is we can pursue intellectual pursuits. We can read. We can study. We can learn. We can grow. Right. That's, that's the hope. That's the. I mean, that's what the Jetsons gives us, and that's. If you remember Sleeper, the Woody Allen movie, it was he made fun of the people who were being artists who had no real talent. But that's what it was. Is the future is everyone's an artist, everyone just sort of pursues their own thing, and they don't have to worry about uh, driving to and from work or those kinds of things. That's the utopia, right? Uh, I, you know, obviously there's a lot of room for dystopia. It's, a, it's an exciting time. It's a very exciting time to be alive. The dystopia? Are you afraid of, uh, concerned about the dystopia? 
Of course, of course. It's it's by exciting time. I mean, the, the you're familiar with the Chinese proverb that is it's a curse. May you live in exciting times. It's it's not actually a Chinese curse, but it's an urban legend that it's a Chinese curse. Anyway, yeah, you see, there's going to be lots of change, and hopefully, you know. Hopefully it's for the good. There's not a lot of evidence on that. Have you seen the Terminator movies? You know, that's kind of, that's that's one way it could go. There's a lot of videos that are being shared where robots are, there's one that you may have seen where the robot is not following orders to kind of walk uh, towards the edge of a table. So the, the robot is not complying because the robot knows that he's going to basically go kaput. In that vein of questioning, well, you, you, you can't talk about that stuff without talking about uh, the science fiction robots uh, that Asimov created, right? So he explored this space a lot with uh, the robots have to follow these rules where they don't hurt people and they don't hurt themselves and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and that's kind of abstract and interesting. But more interesting, I think, is the decision-making that's happening in robots Robots right now today when Google programs their self-driving robot to not have accidents at some point these robots are going to be faced with a choice I can cause an accident that kills these four people or kills these four people uh, or these three people right and so you're gonna to have to program it so that it chooses to make these sorts of moral decisions. And, and the self-driving cars are out today on the roads. You know, these decisions are being decided by software engineers right now. Uh, and what are they going to... So, you know, that's obvious, you, I guess. You know, you kill the three people, not the four people. Uh, but it gets more interesting. Do I kill the three people or do I kill the person in my car, right? So will my own car choose to kill me to save other people? You know, uh, that's a that's a crazy question, <laughs> but the self-driving cars are going to be here in like five years-ish, and they're going to have to have that question answered, and I don't know how to answer it. it that's a scary, terrifying question to ask. I don't, I don't know. It's an exciting time. Maybe I can bribe, I can bribe the machine to not kill me, but will that be against the law then? I, I don't know. Uh, what you're doing here with Picasso is also artificial intelligence of a, of a benev benevolent um, kind? Well, mostly. Aside from the people it's putting out a word. Right, right, right. We established that. You're, the paint isn't poisoned. What is the artificial intelligent? Try to explain this to me, uh, which would be the equivalent to explain it to your grandmother, although probably your grandmother has a PhD in, in, in physics. So No, she lived in rural Missouri. Um, okay, so... <laughs> It has to do with searching, okay? So kind of like when you type a search term into Google and Google goes out and finds, uh, if, you, if you just type in a single word, it goes out and finds that single word. But if you type in a number of words, it tries to go out and find all of them and like it tries to find them if close together in the document. Anyway, the search becomes more complicated and sophisticated. So it's exactly that. We're asking a computer to search for an image. So there's an entire... Think of the space of all possible images. It's, there are a lot of images in there. And conceptually, the computer can think about that space and walk around in it and try to find one that matches your criteria. Okay? So until very recently, the criteria we could provide was very rudimentary. Find an image that's red, right? And then it would be like, I don't know if you've seen Google's color search. They'll find pictures for you that are red. And wow, that's fascinating. <laughs> and it searches the, the web for them. Well, they're primarily red or they have a red component that is, that is sort of dominant. Mm -hmm. Or red. And those are the kinds of searches. Anyway, so six months ago, a year ago, Google came up with this technology that allows uh, computers to recognize images. So they watch video and they can recognize, oh, there's a cat in that video. Or maybe more interestingly, oh, there's a terrorist in that video. Um, or there's uh, a shredding machine was the big example they used when they first announced this because people can't even recognize shredding machines. But they train this computer, does a really great job at recognizing shredding machines. Paper shredders. Paper shredders. Paper shredders. Can you recognize, if you saw a paper shredder, would you, I don't know, I wouldn't recognize it. You can train it to recognize everything. And it's built off of the human visual cortex. It's sort of magical the way it works, but we've been using it for handwriting recognition for a long time. Anyway, now it recognizes images. 
Now that you have a program that can recognize things, you can write the second program that searches for images that match. And searches, and by searches, the entire space of images, I mean sort of create an image that matches. So you might have seen these Google Deep Dream things where they take a picture of a person and they search for eyeballs in it. And then over time, the eyeballs get enhanced and suddenly you've got this hallucinogenic image. They're still popular in some circles, but there were, there were dog heads, you know, and there were eyeballs and there were lizards and stuff. And people were producing these images. But wait, when an image does not have any eyeballs in it, then what does the machine find? So when an image doesn't have, it uses that as a base and it creates an image that puts the eyeball in it. So it, what it does is it looks at the pixels and it looks at it It finds the area that is most eyeball-ish, okay? So that might be in an armpit. It's like this armpit looks 1% like an eyeball, right? And using artificial intelligence, then it slightly tweaks the pixels so that the armpit now looks 2% like an eyeball. And then it does that again and again and again and again and again. And after, you know, 100 iterations, it looks 100% like an eyeball. And suddenly there's an eyeball in this guy's armpit. This this example will make more sense if you actually see one of these images. Uh, instead of training it on shredding machines and terrorists and eyeballs and cats, you train it on a Picasso painting, right? And you say, find me an image uh, that matches the input image. So you can, you can tailor your search, right? So you say, find me an image that matches the input image Uh, at a global scale and matches the style image at a local scale. And for you and me, I don't know quite what that request means, right? And it's entirely possible that there is no image that satisfies that constraint, but it turns out there is, and it looks an awful lot like Picasso painted the picture that you put in. But that's so amazing because style, I mean, you know, Of course, we we can look at Picasso, and then there, you know, you can you can explain to a three year old. Okay, look here, in terms of the perspective, uh, it's it's flat over here, and the colors. But there is so much more to. to, to I know, I know. So what happens is is you have this simulation of the human visual cortex, and th through the magic of neural nets, you teach it to recognize Picasso paintings. So. We don't know quite how it works. So it learns. It learns. And it has a neural structure just like exists in our brains behind our eyes, uh, in between our eyes and our brains. So it is, it is behaving exactly like that section of our brain to learn to recognize this. And this is a technology we discovered like 40 years ago. And we've been using it to recognize handwriting. Uh, uh, but now we can recognize a Picasso painting. We're not entirely sure how it works, but it does a really good job. And because it does this good job, now we can ask it to create a Picasso painting from what it's learned. But, but, but when basically with your app, it takes a few minutes. I mean, depending on it, you, you say in the app, it take, can take uh, sometimes up to 10 minutes. So that what it actually does, basically, once I feed it the source material, then it goes off and trains itself, the machine. Yes. Yes, exactly so. Trains it on the source, trains it on the, on the two sources, and tries to create a mixture of the two uh, globally and locally. Uh, and, and so that's, that's the level at which we understand this now, because there's not much more, unless we, until we start understanding the brain better uh, and how these neural systems actually work, uh, that's, that's the extent of what we can do. And all we can say is, wow, that is amazing looking. <laughs> But when somebody like you tells sort of, you know, a musician like like me, I always use musician as if we're all stupid. We're, we're not, but um, we're not uh, trained in the field or we're not um, uh, inside uh, the, the field of writing um, artificially intelligent um, programs. When you say something like this is as much as we know about these things, I mean, but you are writing this code. What, the, what do you mean by saying uh, this is as far as we know? Well, 
we can write code that we don't understand. The way the brain works, assuming there are no more surprises, but it doesn't look like there really are, we know how the cells work. They're neurons, they're connected to other neurons, they fire, and that causes the next one down the chain to fire, and so on. Uh, the rules for these neurons are very simple. Uh, but what happens is, is when you get a bunch of them together, uh, the word that people use for this is emergent. When you get a bunch of things together following simple rules, they can have behaviors that sort of go beyond what you expect is possible. And they go beyond what you expect is, is beyond what you can understand. So another example of emergent behavior is the flocking in birds. So birds follow this very simple procedure to flock, and it produces these extraordinary behaviors. Or ants. Ants follow a very simple set of rules for following chemicals, trails, and leaving chemical trails, and, or bees. Uh, they, they exhibit these you know, seemingly intelligent behaviors until you, you get inside. Uh, neural nets are the, the quintessential example of this emergent behavior. They you know, they give rise to consciousness, uh, and we can simulate it, but we don't understand it. It's, it's too, we can see all the moving gears, but that doesn't let us predict what it's going to do, for instance. Uh, it doesn't let us, it, it's, it's still, being able to simulate something doesn't, doesn't let you understand it. Now I understand, and we talked about this, this is really well explained, uh, we talk, and now we're back in sort of, I mean, my mind at least is back sort of in dystopian territory. There's a lot of room for dystopia, yeah. This leads me down to this other thing which we talked about in the past. I mean, you you do believe, and, and you kind of hinted at that, where you say we, we kind of understand everything about the brain. But you also uh, believe, am I right, that uh, the, the brain is, I mean, is akin to a machine. There is really nothing kind of special about it. Yeah, no. I, well, I mean, it's very special. It's very it, it's beautiful, wonderful, lovely, literally lovely things uh, that we don't understand yet. But when we look at it really close, we can see the gears. Oh, but but the soul. <laughs> well, did the soul die with James Brown? I mean, what is happening? Are you intentionally trying to provoke me on my book, which is now on Amazon? <laughs> oh, please plug your book. Yeah, I, I'm going to order it right now. Even if you concede that the human mind is a cogwork, there is something very similar to a soul that falls out that is equally stunning and surprising. But that's a much bigger topic. Hogwarts don't mean the end of the soul, but it is a very different conception of the soul. But it does have properties that are remarkably similar in a sort of coincidental and stunning way. What is the name of your book? Amusements. Those are the essays that you sent me. Yes, yes. It's, uh, it's more or less self-published right now. It's ridiculously expensive. Uh, if I get a moment from this app insanity, I will make a Kindle version and you can download it for a dollar. Earlier today, I discovered a Frank Zappa uh, channel of a drummer who is transcribing their super complicated material and plays it along with a MIDI track that he programmed himself. And it is just unbelievable. And while you were talking about sort of the, you know, the machine is analyzing this and go like, you know, all these people that are sort of sitting there for weeks and months transcribing this, the Zappa material and then teaching themselves how to play it and then put it on YouTube. Well, and it's, and it's a labor of love. So I don't think they mind if their labor of love is made easier. It's just they want to have it done. But could you do that same thing now with music? Let's say you feed it. A... That is one of the many avenues we need to explore right because <laughs> there's there's no reason why this shouldn't be equally stunningly applicable to to recognizing sounds i recognize the sound of frank zappa i recognize the sound of chickens let's make let's turn frank zappa into a chicken yeah oh my god that would be that would really uh, 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 the machine really analyzing the, the components how is this made and then applying it to a different genre, instrumentation. Mm -hmm. It's super cool. So that was, uh, that's why I've embarked on, so I've got a whole company now. I don't know if I told you, we've got, we scored our funding, we're hiring people. Uh, my goal isn't, uh, my goal isn't just the app. I was sort of, my friends wanted me to do this, and I'm like, well, the app is cool, but, you know. But then when I realized that this is just, this is, this is oh, there is 
a mountain of cool technology here. So we're going to start mining it. Music, video, 3D. You can. It, it's just. It's just storytelling. <laughs> Because the neural nets can recognize story types and they can recognize writing styles. I wanted to end on a positive note because I was just going to say, you know, this is uh, how far are we out uh, replacing, you know, stories. I mean, it comes down to can the machines recognize it? And now that now, which they can, we've known that for a long time. That's how they do. I don't know if you've ever seen this writing analysis where I think they did it with primary colors. That was the book that nobody knew who wrote it, but then they analyzed people's writing styles and they're like, oh, well, we know it was this guy. Um, we've been able to recognize these things and now we've cra crossed a threshold where the computers can use this recognition to produce. So you're expanding, you're putting a company together. Yeah. So first of all, for researching these phenomena, uh, people want products. What is a what is the product? I don't care about I don't care about products. Uh, I mean, I literally don't care about products. But what I do care about is letting people play with this amazing technology, so that those turn out to be products in the end, like this app. Right. I care about this app because now people can paint, like my friend can paint his George Bush Twin Towers explosion picture that he could never have done before. Uh, and that's, that's what I'm interested in. So uh, I, know that I, I know there are a lot of people who want to productize this and feed it into Instagram and get Facebook to buy us, which may or may not happen. I don't care so long as I can enable people to play with it. Play is really what it comes down to. I want to play. That is that is very important. That's why you're, that's why you're awesome. You said uh, you don't, uh, you're not interested in product. Please, please stay that way. Keep it playful. Don't feed it to the behemoth. Right. Well, uh, you know, if they want to eat it, that's fine. But they won't stop me from, uh, you know, creating the next thing. So, last question about virtual reality, just completely sort of a non sequitur. What do you think? What is your two cents about the VR hype right now? There's a lot of stuff going on that you can watch, but my favorite thing to look at is uh, the, you know her. Who is she? Noni de la Pena. Noni de la Pena. Her talking about it as an empathy machine, right? The New York Times just put out the Google, the Google Cardboard thing, and they had – I didn't see it myself, but I guess they had some kind of experience with refugee kids or something. It's a good way to 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 get people to feel it. It's a good way to get people to feel things that you couldn't get them to feel before. And I think I think above all else, that is going to make it catch fire. Uh, I don't know how long it'll take because I thought Second Life was going to catch fire too, uh, but it will. It will. I guess I mean that's a that's the broad question, but you kind of answered. The, I should have asked specifically how long do you think uh, this may take or is this sort of now is it is it going to be sort of established and then live side by side with all these other um, opportunities we have to kind of engage or, or will it be on the shelf as a novelty item you know it could be a novelty item I guess it seems like it won't it could but in the end uh, 15 years from now it won't I don't know how it'll manifest, but people will be experiencing these virtual experiences, and, and people will be making movies. And well, by that time, people won't be making movies, man. The machines will be making your your company will have machines that make those movies. Right. I want a movie that has some robots and it's 3D, and then the AI just makes it for me. And then I say, no, I want it to be more blue. Yeah, and then Data, and as in Star Trek Next Generation, goes in and says he wants the Sherlock Holmes adventure, but he wants the bad guy to be uh, on par with his intelligence, and then it's over. Ooh, that's dangerous. Don't do that. This is interesting. It, where are we with speech emulation? Right, 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 right. I mean, we're still. I mean, we're still kind of stringing things together. I mean, I heard about the story about these sort of robocalls where they have pre. I mean, they have phrases, but they're not completely yet. Uh, you know, synthesizing. Are you aware? So there are there are neural networks that can recognize speech, right? So they can recognize speech with the latest breakthroughs, that means they can generate speech. They can recognize a certain person's voice patterns, so now they can generate a certain person's voice patterns. 
depending on how good the recognition is, determines how good the the production the generation is. So yeah. But is it good? Have you heard something that's good? I haven't I haven't heard anything that's good. It's brand new. The the paper for this artistic stuff came out three months ago. Uh, people, their implementations are just barely coming online, which is also cool. It's one of the cool things I've been able to do is to get this out, turn this around so fast and put it in people's hands. Uh, but yeah, no, it is, it is freakishly white hot new. All right. So that was Carl Stiefvater. <clears throat> Excuse me. I can't get this, uh, cough away, um, as I'm recording this, uh, outro. That was Carl Stiefvater. We're linking to some amazing Picasso photos. Um, and his book, of course, that you can pick up for a little bit over $60, actually, on Amazon. Um, I have his book in email format, and I'm going to reread it, and then we'll catch up with him talking a little bit more about uh, the depth of AI. Meantime, next week, um, as indicated, psychology students Joy Iso and Nico Regenti uh, on uh, researching dreams Uh, with virtual worlds really amazing um, story joe will also be back and we'll have jessica lyon lyon <coughs> excuse me jessica lyon and uh kiana Ryder from mad p jessica from Pfizer. i'm talking about the new gateway program um in second life that's it for the show have a great weekend guys the drax files radio and thanks for with listening. joe yardley is and a bye. weekly production of basic drax entertainment the show is supported by Maven Holmes, Giza Creations, Botanical, Strawberry Sing, Abranimations, Eros Avatars, Caravel Design, Avacon, The Cube Republic, Fateware by Damien Fate, The Avazines Publication Family, What Next, Dutchy Furniture, Landscapes Unlimited, Dwarfins, The Den, Following Gods Incorporated, Feroche SL, Giant Snail Races Every Saturday, Kona Stream, and Death Row Designs. Contact the show via Skype, Drax Files, Avatar, Drax Files, or email radio at draxfiles.com.